Rumble strips. We've been in this series. This is our third week. This is our final week. And we started talking about rumble strips as these, as these grooves in the pavement along the side of the road that warn us of when we are moving in the wrong direction, when we start to drift in the wrong direction. And the first week we talked about why we needed rumble strips, right? That rumble strips are important. And then last week, Greg taught us on what we can do, some actual practical rumble strips that we can put in our life whenever we have gone on a monotonous journey, right? That's oftentimes when we need the rumble strips and we're familiar with everything that's going on when we become bored and we start drifting a little bit. I'm not going to belabor any of that. Go watch it. It's good. You can slow his down too, all right? That's fine. But today... What I wanted to talk about is those intentional, and they are intentional, those intentional grooves that we put in there when it comes to our relationships with others. Shoulder rumble strips are what's on the shoulder whenever they're there to protect you from running off the road yourself. But those center line rumble strips are there to protect you from going into somebody else's lane, right? Those are the rumble strips we put in, when our, in with our relationships to other. The, others, the other day, I started, um, uh, I was going through Mount Vernon, going up to Amish country area. And after we came through Gambier, uh, we were heading up to 62. It was dark. And there's a stop sign that's up there that I always forget is there. But uh, while everybody else was asleep in the car, I hear, they've got these rumble strips going across. Like, listen, it's a late night. You're on a backcountry road. You're going 65 and a 45. Warning, there's a stop up here. Otherwise, you're going to end up in somebody else's lane. You're going to end up in traffic. You're going to end up doing some damage to somebody else. Our, our scripture that we found, that we're, we're kind of using, is found in Ephesians chapter 5. And it's where Paul's talking with the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus. Um, and he's talking about how uh, God has blessed the people. The book of Ephesians is all about the blessings for the first three chapters. And then, uh, and then the behavior for the next chapters, right? And this is in that behavior section, and here's what it says in verses 14 through 17. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to try to unpack a little bit of that as we determine what the will of the Lord is in our relationship with others. What rumble strips can we put up in our relationships with others? You guys have all seen that, that video on Facebook or that YouTube video that someone comes up and there's a person sleeping in the passenger seat, right? And then you get up and you get right behind somebody with the headlights coming this way. You guys know what I'm talking about? You, you go right up behind somebody with the headlights uh, turning your way, you could be stopped or anything like that, that person's sleeping and you lay on the horn and you start screaming and that person wakes up and they see headlights coming right at them, it's not a funny joke if it's done to you. But if it's not done to you, it's hysterical, right? Because what happens? What does that person who's asleep do? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That person sits up and that person screams. Why do they scream? Because, they, because of what's, they know what's going to happen. They know that they're going to be in a head-on collision. They, they've not been aware of what's going on, and they wake up to see something that's about to happen. Their wildest dreams, their wildest fears coming true. Oh, man. It, 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 it's, it's a hysterical joke for those who are watching. <laughs> but it's actually a joke that isn't all that funny. I remember vividly. Anybody remember getting your license for the very first time? I remember vividly getting my license and I'm not going to tell you how old I was at each of these stages because they're probably not the correct ages I should have been getting my license and realizing these things. But I remember vividly getting in the driver's seat and starting to drive and realizing I could do some serious damage. <laughs> I could do some serious damage. My dad started me uh, driving. Uh, my friends had a really long, long, long driveway, all gravel. And that's, that's where he started me driving in this area that I had nothing else to worry about. It was just, you know, getting used to everything. And then I'd go to parking lots where there's just parked cars. And then I'd go to on, uh, you know, rural roads where there's not very many cars. And then you continue to move forward and forward and, and faster and faster and more dangerous and more risky situations, right? And this is kind of how I learned to drive. But the day that I'll never forget about my driver's license, or whenever I, uh, it was long after I got my driver's license, but I sat in that behind the wheel of the car and I realized, man, I could really do some damage to some property with this. 
I, I wasn't like gleefully happy, like I wasn't malicious in trying, but I thought about that and I was like, holy smokes, I could really do some damage. And then I froze in a little bit of panic and fear, realizing that I could do a whole lot of damage to property, to my life, to my dad's property that I was driving, but I could do even more damage to other passengers on the road, to other people who were traveling even innocent people who were traveling in the backseat, kids. And as I started to really think about that, I was like, man, the amount of damage that I could inflict is crazy. But, but it's this idea that I could be okay, but man, other people change the game. Am I right? Other people change the game. And I feel like a lot of times we're in conflict with other people. You guys ever been in conflict with somebody? Yeah, people just make everything worse. My grandma would say it like this. Life would be a lot easier without people. Amen? <laughs> yeah. My life would be a lot easier without people because they complicate everything. And in our walk, in our life, in our life with Christ, right, we can, be, we can have problems. We can have conflict in our life with just us, with just us and God. But man, when we add people, it adds a whole different dimension to what we're doing. It adds a whole different dimension. If you think about it, our life from birth to death is marked by conflict with others. Whether it's playing, you know, arguing over which toys that you're going to play with as a kid, or arguing over politics as an adult, or arguing over how much you should get paid and what a fair amount is, or, or how much you should see your grandkids, our life is scarred by conflict. It's from the beginning to the end. It's going to be that eternal conflict. And all, honestly, that conflict is, the Bible tells us why we have that conflict. It's ultimately our conflict with God, wanting to put ourselves first. And when I want to put myself first, and when I'm paying attention to only who I am, oh man, that's when conflict gets real here, but it also gets real here. And now I'm in conflict with you, and you're in conflict with God, and you're in conflict with one another, and in conflict just continues to build. Paul knew this whenever he wrote to the church in Ephesus, that conflict among believers, among people, among human beings, that you have to do life with other people. In verse 15, be very careful how you live. Be very careful how you live. Guess what? We live with people. With people come problems. You're not alone in, your, in this world. And with those people, oftentimes, others can be the most difficult part of the journey. But we don't want to live as unwise people. We want to live as wise people, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So how can we not be foolish how can we be full of conflict, but be wise about it? I mean, this is something that I feel, I feel we need to know as a church right here. As a church, we should be better. I'm calling me too. Like, I'm not just pointing a finger at you. As a church, we should be better because remember, Paul wrote this, this letter to the church of Ephesus saying, God has blessed you so you don't have to deal with all of this conflict. God has blessed you so the conflict has been resolved in him. And he has a, the ability to be able to take that away. How can we do that, though? We can put up rumble strips in our life. We can put up rumble strips in our life that are going to start warning us when you're like, hey, you're going the wrong way. Hey, you're getting too close to the edge. Because the rumble strips aren't after you've went over the cliff. That's not going to do any good. The rumble strips are well before, sometimes even within the boundary of the lines that we have, just to start warning us that we're drifting. Paul is sharing with the church that Jesus had come to bless them so they could overcome obstacles of living with difficult people. Isn't that good news? Overcome the problems of living with difficult people. Oh, that's, that's good stuff. And when we're able to do that, we're able to tell a better, more compelling story. So here's what's going to happen today. Are you guys ready? I've got five areas that um, I, I'm going to talk about today. And some of you guys might say, well, scripturally show me where this is. Not, none of these are going to be pulled directly from scripture um, from, a, from a verse, you know, like, oh, here's the verse. But it's going to be, here's what the wisdom of Scripture teaches us on how to live with others. Here's what the wisdom of Scripture teaches us on how to live with others. Rumble strips, practical things that we can do in our life to put down on the road of our life to where when we're journeying, we can recognize before we get into a huge mess, because problems, people, right? And when we have problems, when we, when we miss, if we miss on the shoulder, who, who does that affect? It affects us. When we miss on the center line, who does that affect? That affects a lot more people. Decisions are a lot more costly. Damages are a lot worse. 
And you can do a lot of damage in the lives of other people and in the lives of yourself, in the lives of innocent people, in the lives of bystanders watching if we're not careful, if we're not wise in how we interact with others. So last week, Greg gave you an old-style sermon. He, gave, he did an acrostic talk, right? T-A-L-K, and K was comfort. That's what I remember. <laughs> Go watch it. It was really good. All right? Comfort isn't spelled with a K. Um, but but he, he did an old school one last week, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to follow suit, and I'm going to do an old school sermon style this week. I'm going to do a classic five-point sermon, and they're all going to start with the same letter. But does any of y'all ever play uh, Scattergories? Any of you guys like Scattergories? Yeah? Uh, no, nope, nobody. Okay, a few of you. Um, Scattergories, I love that game, the family game, but you get double points whenever you have the same two words that start with the same letter. So all of these are going to be double points, so I've got ten points here um, that are going to happen. You guys got to laugh with me, otherwise I just feel like I'm talking to nobody again. Like, like I'm talking to my kids sometimes. It's okay. I'll wait. Oh, thanks, thanks. I just wanted to make sure you're there. All right? All right, so here we go. The first one. Purpose people. Purpose people. These are all going to be guidelines. These are all going to be rumble strips that we're going to, we can put in our life. They're going to be a litmus test for you to be able to sit there and say, even today, am I doing this? Is this something that I could add? Because what, what the question is going to be is purpose people. Who are the people in your life I am choosing? Who are the people in my life I am choosing? How many intentional relationships do I have? Now, I'm, whenever I'm talking about this, whenever I'm going to be sharing with you, some of these things might not apply to you. Some of these things might apply to other people, but I, they're, they're great questions for us to be able to put in our back pocket because sometimes in our life, our situation changes. Am I right? Anybody, your situation ever changed in life? You went from being not married to being married. You went from being an aunt to being an aunt like four times, right? You went from being in high school to in college. You went from being, um, uh, you know, whatever it might be working full-time to retirement, our life situations change, but people don't. Who are the people in your life that are on purpose? Now, whatever I'm talking about, uh, we were meant to be intentional, in- intentional, meaningful relationships with people. You guys believe that? When God created us, he created us to be in a relationship. God created man, saw it wasn't good for him to be alone, so he created Eve, right? He created this intentional meaningful relationship. And I want to define my terms here. And by this, whenever we're talking about intentional, I'm talking about time spent, right? I'm talking about time being spent when you're hanging out outside of what you just normally have going on. It's the, it's the parents in the soccer, in the soccer uh, list, you know, right? The, we all have people, it's the coworker in the cubicle next to you. We all have people that we're just in a relationship with because of proximity, right? In a relationship because of where we are in our life or where we are. But are you choosing those people? Are you choosing those people or is it just like, well, wherever the dice lands, these are the people that are going to be in my life, right? Who are the people that you are choosing to have intentional, to have intentional, meaningful, diverse relationships with? Conversation. Does your conversation... Go beyond just the weather. Go beyond just what happened to you today. Go beyond just how you're feeling, but what you're going through. Someone that you can rely on, something that you can depend on, right? Does your conversation go deeper than just surface things? And then the third one is diversity. Does everyone in your friend group, does everyone that you're choosing to be around look like you, smell like you, think like you, vote like you, talk like you, act like you? We're supposed to be in a diverse relationship with other people. So we can begin, as James talks about it, so, so what we can do is we can begin really taking the considerations of how others feel. Because if everyone that I hang out with is like me, well, first of all, what an awesome world that would be. <laughs> you guys laughed too hard at that one, all right? But if everyone was like me, man, I would not be considerate of anything else because the only people I'm hanging out with are people that agree with me, are people that think like me, are people that act like me. It, it, this, is, this has never been more true than whenever I got married. I didn't show up to a ceremony and be like, all right, I'm getting married today. All right, um, yes, you're in a white dress. Come on up here. We're going to get married. No, it was something that I thought about. It was something that I entered into carefully and cautiously. I said, you're somebody that I'm choosing to spend time with, even if we're not local, even if we're not really close, even whenever you're 250 miles away, I'm going to choose to spend time with you. I'm going to engage in conversation with you more than just surface things. And, and man, 
My, I don't know if you've met my wife, but she's a lot different than me. <laughs> and that makes me a better person, and it makes her a better person because we're choosing diversity. Take inventory of your relationships. If some of these things don't land on your relationships, on your people on purpose, the rumble strip, you're not, you're not too far gone, but man, it's something to start taking notice of. Some other relationships that we can definitely have and that scripture teaches time and time again is we should be having relationships with people um, in, in our spiritual life as well. We should all have people in our life that we're submitting to their, their spiritual authority. We should all have people in, their li- in our life that, that we are gleaning from, that we have given license and right to speak into our life, right? And these can't be TV evangelists. They don't know that you exist. <laughs> Who are the people in your life that, that you are? Paul, there's, there's a Bible character for each of these. Who is the Paul in your life that you have entered into a relationship with and that you have chosen to enter into a relationship with? And they know you've chosen that and they've agreed to be in that relationship with you that is going to speak spiritual authority and truth into your life. Do you have that person? What about, what about Barnabas? Barnabas was a, a, a person, so we've got the spiritual authority in our life, this person that we've, we've entered into a relationship with. We've also got the Barnabas of our life, right? The person that we're just saying, hey, listen, you're in my small group. This is someone that encourages you and holds you accountable. This is somebody that, that, that knows about your life, that knows about your faith, that you talk openly with. And whether they're uh, spiritually more mature than you or spiritually less mature than you, you've given that right and that license to encourage one another and build each other up. And I, I feel like sometimes we forget the Barnabases of our life. Who are those people? If you don't have a Barnabas in your life, rumble strip. Again, I told you, this is just taking inventory. The other one is, is the Timothy, right? So you got Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy. Paul's kind of that spiritual mentor, that spiritual head. And then you've got Barnabas, who's that, that man, he's just the buddy that's coming along, and he's there for you, and you're there for him. And then you've got the Timothy, which is the person that you were training. Paul was training Timothy. Barnabas was training Timothy. They, they were leading him. They were guiding him. They were further along in their faith than, than he was. And so they, they made sure in their life that they were passing down what God has done in their life to the next generation, to the next person, to the person that they were choosing to be in connection with. It wasn't Paul, it was, Timothy wasn't just a stowaway on the ship, right? They were inviting him into conversation. And in our lives, in our worlds, in our inventory of our friends that we're choosing to be around, do you have a Paul? Do you have a Barnabas? Do you have a Timothy? Do you have somebody that, that you've given spiritual authority in your life? Do you have somebody who... Uh, is that, listen, these are just my accountability partners. These are my life group people that, man, I'm going to be honest and open with, and I believe what they have to say to me. They're going to call me out. And do you have the people that you're leading? And none of these things have age requirements on them. If you're a teenager sitting in here, you can still be leading somebody. I know there's a lot of teenagers who serve in kids' church, and they're leading even younger people to Christ. And it's amazing. So relationships. And we've all had people that moved away. We've all had these at one point. A lot of us have had these at one point, and maybe through life situations or circumstances or death or, or, or a job change that you've lost this person in your life. That's a rumble strip, though. Just because you've lost them in your life doesn't mean you can't replace that with something new or you can't FaceTime somebody. Man, this is exciting. We've got to be able to have those people in our life, those people who are on purpose. Sound good? All right, next one. Present posture. Present posture. Are you, am I present with others? Am I present with others? Am I paying attention to the people around me? Rumble strip. Whenever we're sitting here, when we put up our rumble strips, if you can realize, if you have to answer no to this question, man, this is a rumble strip for us because so many times we kind of get caught up in what we're doing. The number one reason for auto accidents, does anyone know? Distracted driving. We kind of get so distracted in, in, the, in our surroundings, in our phones, in our screens, and not paying attention that we don't pay attention to the things that are right in front of us. We end up not paying attention to the things right in front of us. And listen, I'm, I'm the guilty one of this. I'm one of the most guilty people. I'll be sitting there on the couch and I'll be scrolling on my phone. My kids are sitting there engaging and they're talking and they're asking me questions. Kristen's ch- talking to me, asking me questions or something like that. And I'm just like, yep. And I'm answering. I- I'm kind of doing the le- bare minimum, but I'm not present in the conversation. In our, in our uh, passage, the English Standard Version says this. Look carefully where you are. 
Look carefully where you are. When we look carefully, when we're paying attention to the things that are right in front of us, we are present with that person. We're not setting a very good example of Christ. We're not being a good reflection of who Christ is in our life when we're just kind of zoned out and don't really care about what anybody else is saying. When we're not present with the people that we want to engage with, when the people that we're trying to reach, when we're not present with that person, when we're not taking a, a posture of being present with that person, oh man, we're missing so much of an opportunity. And it's not easy. It's easy to get lost in the scroll. It's easy to get lost in the screen time. It's easy to try to multitask, right? But we're missing the opportunity. A rumble strip that I put in my life, because again, I, I told you, I'm chief of sinners right here, right? I'm not telling you this because you need to get better. I'm telling this, me this because I need to get better. Am I present with others? And whenever I had to sit there and answer that question honestly, and I'll say, no, I'm not being present with my kids. I'm not being present with my family. I'm not being present with my wife. Something else always has my attention, or maybe not always, but you know, a vast majority of the time. I had to put in a rumble strip. Here's one that I did. I started to recognize that my, the posture that I took was important. And whenever I was sitting on the couch, when I was sitting on my couch in my home, man, I was in this comfortable posture. This was family time, and I continued to get lost in my phone. So here's what I did. I'm not telling you to do this. Here's what I did. I told my kids, I said, kids, I need to fix something. I need to change something. And I'm giving you the authority in my life to help me change something. If I'm on, my, if I'm on the couch, if I'm in a posture where I should be paying attention to you, if I am on the couch, I cannot be on my phone. Are any of my kids listening? What happens if I'm on my phone on the couch? You have to yell at me. <laughs> I've given my kids to yell at me whenever I'm on the phone at my couch. Why? It's a reminder to stay in a posture of presence with my family. And it's really annoying whenever someone sends me a text and I'm sitting there on the couch and I pull out my phone and I start looking at it and one of the kids from, you know, not even in the room can sense that I'm now on the phone and they come running, Dad, I'm yelling at you, you're not supposed to be doing that. I'm like, Yes, I know. So I have to stand up. I have to change my posture and say, I'm present with my phone right now. Now I'm back with you guys. What are those areas in your life where you can actually put in a rumble strip to say, I am going to be present with the people that I am with. I'm going to be present with the people that I am with. Next one is this. Practice patience. Practice patience. Do I have someone in my life testing my patience? This one's a tough one. This one's, this one's going to ruffle some feathers. I'm sorry for everybody who's here right now. This one ruffles feathers so much. How do I treat people who annoy me? Answer that question for you. Don't, don't yell it out, right? Uh, answer that question. How do you treat people that annoy you? If you're, if you're trying to justify how you treat them right now, the answer is probably not the best one, right? If you're, well, they had it come. They just, you don't understand. They make my skin crawl, right? They had it coming, right? If they would just stop being dumb, I wouldn't have to treat them this way. Ah, listen, I think we all have those annoying people in our life. We have those people who are driving in the fast lane five miles under the speed limit in the passing lane, and you're right behind them, and you're just like, come on, dude, come on. And I know how I justify it. Well, they can't hear me. You know, like, I'm not, I don't actually roll down the windows and, uh, you know, wave to them with certain fingers or anything like that. Like, they don't know how I'm treating them. It's all good. The people who leave their turn signal on for like 20 miles and you keep thinking they're getting over, yeah, those people are annoying. Or the people that don't use their turn signal. Maybe for you, the annoying people are the people that everyone's waiting patiently in this line to get off the exit and that guy goes, zoom, and then cuts in at the last minute cutting you off. Oh, we've got annoying people in our life. And if you don't, Lord bless you, they're coming. <laughs> I can only take comfort in the fact that, oh, you're, you've got somebody waiting for you that's just going to be in your life, that, oh, they're going to be the, the top winner. How do we treat people that are annoying to us? How do I treat people? And if you have to try to answer that in a different way, how do I treat my boss? How do I treat my coworkers? And if you have to try to justify your answer, rumble strip because we how we treat people is who we are and that's how we're the reflection of who God is and God has given us patience my dad always used to say well I've got all the patience I was born with because I've never used any of them <laughs> but patience isn't it isn't a gift patience isn't height and some of us have it and some of us don't 
Patience is something, it's a, it's a seed, it's, it's a piece of the Holy Spirit, it's a fruit of the Spirit that, that comes into our life and it takes work, it takes patience, it takes intentionality, it takes growth, it takes watering, it takes daily feeding for us to practice patience so we are able to be patient. You want to you learn how to be patient? Try to eat a, bowl or a whole plate of peas with a butter knife. You're going, to be, you're going to be angry, but a little bit more patient at the end of it. How do, we, how do we practice patience? You take that annoying person and you invite them over to your house for dinner. And you say, my goal is going to be to love on them and no matter what they do. Take the most annoying thing that they do and I'm going to assume they're going to do that the whole time. I mean, you have them over for dinner. You have them over to your, don't take them somewhere else. Don't take them where the waiter has to deal with them. You deal with them. That's patience right there. That's going to be tough. I better not get any phone calls and be like, hey, Nate, you want to come over for, for dinner? I'm, like, <laughs> I'm going to have a whole bunch of those later. Practice patience. It's how we grow. Next one, pitiful potholes. I told you they all start with P's and two P's. But I think so many times what happens in our life is we deal with these potholes in our life and we make them the whole story. How much do I complain about the small inconveniences of my life? How much do I complain about the small inconveniences of my life? Now, here's the, here's the rumble strip here. Do I allow small things to ruin my day? You get up early for work, got your alarm, the day's good, you got your coffee, the kids were miraculously amazing that day, and you, you, know, you kiss your spouse before you go off to work, and you get in the car, you turn it on, and it starts right up, and you look, and that light is on in the, the gas tank. That light is on in the gas tank and you know you have to stop and get gas. And for some reason or not, that kind of triggers your day. And now you notice every single small weave, small curve, small thing that's not right with your travel. And then whenever you get to work, you start telling everybody, oh man, my day was, my day was terrible. Because you're, what we end up focusing on, none of these things really had to change anything about your day. But we start focusing on the smallest things that allow us to ruin our day. If we sit there and start focusing, we tell people about all of these small annoyances in our life. Oh my goodness, that's a, that's a rumble strip right there. We're not, allowing, we're not allowing God's spirit to live within us. When our day gets overshadowed by petty preferences, we are diminishing Christ's power and his sacrifice in our life. When it completely overwhelms everything about us, we are diminishing Christ's sacrifice on our life because of my petty preferences. The little pothole that I just had to swerve around, it wasn't a big deal. The little, the, little, the little attitude that I, I could have made a big deal, but like I could have just moved on. I allowed it to fester my life and completely change how I was acting. I told you, 55 minutes, I'm moving on, all right? I'm moving on. And I hope God is, I hope God, just like I get double points for using two Ps in each and every single one of these, I hope God is using these to, to double check how we're doing things. To double check how I'm doing things. What are the things that I'm allowing to get in my life when it comes to other people? But the next one is this. Praise or poison. What are the things that you're allowing to come out of your mouth? What type of person do my words say I am? The words coming out of my mouth, are they, are they uplifting or are they poison? Not just to me, because we all know that. We all know our words have impact. But are, are my words poisonous to other people? Do I act like my words matter? I want us to be able to ask and to wrestle with some of these questions, these, guard, these, these rumble strips we can put in our life. Because if I start acting like my words don't matter, that should be a red flag to us, that we're going the wrong way. Not saying you've went off the cliff yet, not saying that you've run into somebody head on, but what are the things that are going to be able to stop us from moving that direction? Verses 19, uh, Ephesians 5, verses 18 and 19 says this. We didn't read it in the passage, but it's just right below where we stopped reading. Here's what it says. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving, uh, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in His name. When, when we speak with people, man, I, I would hope our words would be would be praise. I hope our words would lift people up. And whenever people are done having a conversation with us, that they feel something different because our lives have been changed. They feel something different. And not that, well, my words don't matter. You guys have all had that conversation with somebody that you don't think cares at all about what you say, cares at all about who you are. And I'm not just talking about our kids. 
Sometimes it doesn't feel like they care what we think or say. But there are people that and when we start acting like our words don't matter, like our words aren't powerful, like our words aren't what they should be, when we start acting that way, we're missing an opportunity, rumble, strip in our lives with others. Now, here's why this is, here's why this is important. Do I have another slide? I don't remember if I have another slide. Yeah, there, yeah, we can leave that one up. Here's why this is important. You guys ever watch a show, a movie, a sports movie? Where they, they feel, it's like every sports movie ever. Like they, they start out and there's this bad thing that's going on. Maybe, maybe they, they're a terrible team or they haven't got the wins that they needed. Right? There are a whole bunch of misfits that sit in there. And then they add the piece that is going to change the game. It's the plot of every movie. They add the piece that is going to change the game. Maybe it was an attitude or a locker room, something that needed adjusted. Or a player that was finally back who was gone for a long time for with an injury. They had this moment where you knew everything had changed. And you knew they were going to go back out and they were going to win the game, right? We've all seen that movie. They've added the coach. They've added the piece that was missing. And then how did that movie end? They went out and they did it. They went out and they did it. The movie doesn't end with like, hey guys, we've added the piece. Awesome. Roll credits. No, no, no. The piece has been added. Now you've got to go play for it. Now you've got to go prove it. Now you've got to take it and use it for what it's meant for. You see, when when Paul told everybody, when Paul told the church in Ephesus that, listen, the piece has been added. The blessing that you guys need, you guys don't have to live like the world any longer. You guys don't have to deal with what the world deals with any longer. You don't have to deal with the conflict that the world deals with because the peace has been added, and that is Christ's blood on the cross. The peace has been added for you and for me. But so many times we play the rest of the game like it hasn't been added. We know it's been added. As a Christian, we know it's been added to our life, but we don't play that way. We get in, we get in small fights with, with other believers We start treating people badly. We start ending up in the same conflict that everybody else who has ever been, who has ever existed in the entire world deals with. And what God has done is he has came, he came here to earth. He sacrificed his son on the cross so we didn't have to do that. So we could reflect something different, not something that's the same. So we can reflect something that the world hasn't seen before. Because he is good and he has given us this opportunity to go out and live a life, but is it up to us to put those rumble strips saying, hey, we're starting to move the wrong direction. And we want to do that so much earlier when it comes to my relationship with you, when it comes to my relationship with each other, because the world is watching. And and remember, we talked about how everything is more explosive with more people. Whenever I have a conflict with you, it affects a lot more people. When I have a conflict with my brother or sister in Christ, the world is watching. When I have a conflict with my neighbor or my mailman, the world is watching for everyone to see. But we don't have to play in this conflict anymore because that is what Christ has done for each and every single one of us. And now it's up to us to put those, put those barriers, put those reminders in, etched in our, in, our, in our concrete of life. Whenever I start moving past this direction, when my friends, when I don't have people in my life who are on purpose, when I'm not being present, when I'm not practicing patience, when I am only focusing on pitiful potholes, we're putting these things in our life so we can talk about how good our God is. We can talk about how good our God is all day. And I told you, I could talk about this all day. I've got got more content. But here's what I want us to do today. I I genuinely think that when God, we've invited God into this space, we've invited God into our lives, we've invited God into what we're doing right here, and I think God is working on each and every single one of us. And we've all got areas of our life that we need to start putting in, putting in guardrails, these practical areas that we can say, hey, I'm going to do this to remind myself that I need to be different. I'm going to do this because I am different. We're going to sing a song to close today called God is Good. And these things, these rumble strips in our life, they're not negative things. These are good things to remind us who God is and that we, as a body of believers, as believers of Jesus Christ, we are to reflect the love of who Jesus Christ is in our relationships with others. Amen? All right, let's stand.